Chapter 2 The road, which passed the cabin, lay like a thread dropped on a patchwork quilt. Stockland, fallow fields, and brushland all appeared to be sewn together by wide fence row stitches of trees. Their bare branches spread out to join together the separate patches of land. Weeds grew on either side of the road in summer, and a thin strip of green clung to life between the dusty tracks. In summer, a horse and wagon almost made no noise in the soft earth. In winter, the ground was frozen. The rattle of wheels and each distinct hoofbeat punctuated the winter quiet. When the wind blew, little clouds of dust would rise in the road and follow the wind tracks across the fields. The boy was allowed to go as far as he wanted on the road to the wanted to on the road, but the younger children couldn't go past the pine clump toward the big house and town the town or the bramble patch where they picked blackberries in the summer in the other direction. Almost no one passed on the road in the winter except to buy flour at the store far down the road or to go to the town of, of a Saturday. Even in summer, a speck on the horizon was a curiosity. People sitting on cabin porches would wonder whether the speck would take the form of a man, a woman, or child. The third day after the boy had awakened the smell of the ham bone and pork sausage, it was still cold and the wind still blew, but the cabin still smelled good and there was plenty to eat. Just as dark was gathering, the boy started to go to the woodpile to bring in wood for the night. The dim light of the lamp ran past the boy as he stood motionless in the cabin door, in the open cabin door. Shut the door, the boy's father called where he sat near the stove, but the boy did not move. Just past the edge of the porch, three white men stood in the dim light. Their heavy boots rattled on the porch floor and the boy backed quickly into the cabin as they pushed their way in. There are two things I can smell a mile, the first man said in a loud voice. One is a ham cooking and the other is a thieving nigger. Get up, the second man ordered. The warm but frozen circle of man, circle of man, woman, and three small children around the stove jumped to their feet. A stool on which a child had been sitting fell backward and made a loud noise. One of the men kicked it across the room. The boy did not move from his place just inside the door. There's the evidence, said the first man. He jerked at the grease-spotted cloth on the tin-top table. The oak slab and the half-eaten ham fell to the floor with a great thud and slid against the wall. You know who I am, said the first man, as he unbuttoned his heavy brown coat and pulled it back to show, his shiny, to show a shiny metal star pinned to his vest. These are my deputies. The stranger nearest the door kicked it shut and swore about the cold. Stick out your hands, boy, ordered the second man. The boy started to raise his hands, but the man was already reaching over the stove, snapping handcuffs on the outstretched wrists of his father. The click of the handcuffs was like the click of a gate latch at the big house where the boy had once gone with his father to work. He had swung on the gate and played with the latch until someone had called out from the house, If you want to swing on a gate, boy, swing on the one behind the house. Get away from the front. The third stranger, who had not spoken, turned toward the door. I'll bring up the wagon. But he did not open the door. Suddenly, the great of the voice of the great dog slattered the heavy, seamlessly endless silence that came between the gruff words of the sheriff and those of his men. Sounder was racing toward the cabin from the fields. He had grown restless from waiting to go hunting with his master and he wanted to wandered away to hunt alone. That's why he hadn't warned them. He always barked and sometimes even in the daytime in, in daytime he would start from under the porch the hair on his back straightened before anyone had a sight sighted of a moving speck at the far end of the road. Somebody's coming or a creature's moving the boy's mother would say. 
Now he was growling and scratching at the door. The noise seemed to undo the fearful shock that had held the smaller children ashen and motionless. The youngest child began to cry and hid behind his mother. He tugged at her apron, but the woman did not move. The men were speaking roughly to Sounder's master. That tear in your overalls is where the striped ticking is. That's where you tore them on the door hook of the smokehouse. We found threads of torn cloth on, in the hook. You're going to wear nothing but stripes pretty soon. Big, wide black and white stripes. Easy to hit with a shotgun. The deputy who had started out to bring up the wagon kicked the door, the closed door and swore at the dog on the other side. Go out and hold that mongrel if you don't want him shot. He held the door ajar, the width of the boy's body, and thrusted him out. The boy fell on the back of the dog, whose snarling jaws had pushed into the light between the boy's legs. A heavy boot half pushed and half kicked the entangled feet of the sprawled boy in the nose of the dog and slammed the door. Get that dog out of the way and hold him if you don't want him dead. The boy, regaining his balance, dragged sound, 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 blah, Sounder off the porch to, and to the corner of the cabin. Then the deputy, hearing the barking move back from the door, he opened it and came out. He walked out of the circle of light and returned soon, leading a horse hitched with, to a spring wagon. A saddled horse followed behind the wagon. The appearance of the horses and the added confusion of people coming from the cabins roused Sounder to new fury. The boy felt his knees give, his arms ached, and the grip on his and his grip on the dog's collar was beginning to feel clammy and wet, but he held on. Chain him up, said the sheriff. The boy thought he was talking, telling him to chain up Sounder, but then he saw that one of the men had snapped a long chain on the handcuffs on his father's wrists. As the men pushed his father into the back of the wagon, his overalls caught in the end of the tailgate bolt, and he tore a long hole in his overalls. The bolt took one side of the ticking patch with it. The man holding the chain jerked it, and the boy's father fell backwards into the wagon. The man swung the loose end of the chain, and it struck the boy's father across the face. One of the deputies pulled the chain tight and tied it to the wagon seat. The two deputies climbed on the wagon seat. The sheriff mounted the saddle horse. The door, cabin door was open. The boy's mother was standing in the doorway. He did not see his brother or and sisters. And there's this picture. It's sad. Sounder was making an awful noise. A half-strangled mixture of growl and bark, the boy spoke to him, but the great paws only dug harder to grip the frozen earth. Inch by inch, the boy was losing his footing. Numbness was beginning to creep up his arms and legs, and he was being dragged away from the corner of the house. The wagon started, and the sheriff rode behind on his horse. Sounder made a great lunge forward, and the boy fell against the corner of the porch. Sounder raced after the wagon. No one yelled after him. The mother stood still on the door in the doorway. The deputy, who was holding the reins, turned on the seat, aimed a shotgun at, at the dog jumping at the side of the wagon, and fired. Sounder fell in the road, and the sheriff rode around him. Sounder's master was still on the back of the, on his back in the wagon, but he did not raise his head to look back. The boy struggled to his feet. His head hurt where he had hit it against the corner of the porch. Now his mother spoke for the first time since he'd opened the door to bring in wood. Come in, child, and bring some wood. Sounder lay in the road. The boy wanted to cry. He wanted to run to Sounder. His stomach felt sick. He didn't want to see Sounder. He sank to his knees at the wood pile. His foot hurt where the door had slammed on it. He thought he would carry in two chunk sticks. Maybe his mother would drag Sounder out of the road. Maybe she would drag him across the fields and bury him. Maybe if she laid him on the porch and put some soft rags under him tonight, he might rise from the dead like Lazarus 
did in the meeting house story. Maybe his father didn't know Sounder was dead. Maybe his father was dead in the back of the sheriff's wagon now. Maybe his father had said it hurt to bounce over the rough road on his back, and the deputy had turned around and on it and on and turned around on the seat and shot him. The second chunk of stick was too big. It slipped out of the boy's arms. Two of his fingers were bruised under the failing the falling wood. Suddenly, a sharp yelp came from the road, just like when a beast stung Sounder under the porch or a briar caught his ear in the bramble the boy thought in an instant the boy was on his feet bruised foot and fingers throbbing head were forgotten he raced into the dark Sounder tried to rise but fell again there was another yelp this one constrained and plaintive the boy trained in night sight when the lantern was dim so as to not so as not to alert the woods creatures, picked out a blurry shape in the dark. Sounder was running, falling, floundering, rising. The hind part of his body stayed up and moved from side to side, trying to lift the front part from the earth. He twisted, fell, and heaved his great shoulders. His hind paws dug into the earth. He pushed himself up. He staggered forward sideways and fell again. One front leg did not touch the ground. A trail of blood smeared and blotted followed him. There was a large spot of mingled blood, hair, and naked flesh on the shoulder. His head swung from side to side, and he fell again and pushed his body along with his hind legs. One side of his head was a mass of blood. The blast had torn off a whole side of his head and shoulder. The boy was crying and calling Sounder's name. He ran backward in front of Sounder. He held out his hand, and Sounder did not make a sign to stop. The boy followed the coon dog under the porch, but he went far back under the cabin. The boy was on his knees, crying and calling, Sounder, Sounder, Sounder. His, his, his voice trailed off into the, to a pleading whisper. The cabin door opened, and the, mother, mother's, the boy's mother stood in the door pale light of the lamp inside ran past the woman over the edge of the porch and picked up the figure of the boy on his hands and knees. Come on, child, the woman said. He is only dying. Inside the cabin, the younger children sat huddled together near the stove. The boy rubbed his hands together near the stove pipe to warm them. He brushed his fing his bruised fingers began to throb again. His foot and his head hurt and his, his he felt a lump rising on the side of his head. If Sounder would whimper or yelp, I know, the boy thought, but there was no sound, no thump, thump, thump of the paw scratching fleas or hitting the floor underneath. Creatures like to die alone, the mother said, after a long time. They like to crawl away where no one can find, nobody can find them dead, especially dogs. He didn't want to be shot down like a dog in the road. Some creatures are like people. The road, the boy thought. What would it be like? Did the shotgun blast a hole in the road? I ain't got the wood, the boy said at last. I'll light the lantern and get it. You know where the wood is. You don't need a lantern, the woman said. The boy paused in the doorway. Then he took the lantern from the nail where it hung beside the possum sack. He took the lantern to the stove, lit a splinter of kindling through the open door draft, and held it to the lantern wick the way his father always did. His mother said nothing to him. She spoke to the younger children instead. I ain't fed you yet. When he got outside, the boy did not go to the wood pile. He followed the trail of blood in its zigzag path along the road. At the end of it, there was a great wide spot, dark on the frozen ground little clumps of Sounder's hair lay in the blood, but there was no hole where the shotgun had blasted. At the edge of the dark stain, the boy touched his finger to something. It was more than half of shoulder's long, thin ear. The boy shivered and moved his finger away. Then he had seen dead lizards and possums and raccoons, but he'd never seen a human animal like Sounder dead. It wouldn't work, he thought, but people always said to put things under your pillow when you go to bed, and if you make a wish, it will come true. And he touched Sounder's ear again, and it was cold, and he picked it up. The one edge of it was bloody and jagged like the edge of a broken window pane. He 
He followed the zigzag trail back along the road, but he could scarcely see it now. He's crying again. At the corner of the porch, he took the possum sack from the nail where it hung and wiped the ear. It gave him shivers. He jumped down quickly and holding the lantern near the ground, he tried to see into the porch. He called Sounder. There was no sound. He went back to wiping the ear. His throat hurt. He put the ear in the pocket of his overall jacket. He was going to put it under his pillow and wish that Sounder wasn't dead. The wind had stopped blowing. This would be a good night. A good hunting night, he thought. Far away, a single lantern was moving into the foothills. The boy was still crying. He had not forgotten the wood. Now, he put out the lantern and hung it against the wall. He went to the woodpile, picked up two chunk sticks, and went into the cabin. The loneliness that was always in the cabin, except when his mother was singing or telling a story about the Lord, was heavier than ever now. It made the boy's tongue heavy. It pressed against his eyes and they burned. It rolled against his ears. His head seemed to be squeezed inward and it hurt. He noticed grease pots on the floor where the oak slab and the ham had fallen. He knew his mother had picked them up. His father would be cold, he thought. With a great rip in his overalls, his mother sat by the stove. You must eat, she said. The, wo the woman said. The boy had been outside a long time, and his mother had fed the other children, and they were already in bed. She did not take down her walnut basket to begin to fill to slow. She did not take down her walnut basket to begin to slow filling of her apron with fat kernels. She did not sing or even hum child child she would say with long spaces between sometimes she would murmur to herself with her eyes closed his little brother would murmur and be addled in his sleep tonight he, the boy thought he would set as long as he his mother would let him maybe his mother would let him set and listen all night the boy listened for a yelp a whine a thump 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 under the floor but there was no sound his mother's rocker did not even move enough to squeak one chunk stick burning atop another. In the stove, rolled against the stove door with a slight thump, the boy startled towards the cabin door. You know where it was the stove, the mother said as she reached for the poker to push the wood back from the door. It sounded outside, the boy said as he pulled the door closed after him. Soon he returned carrying the lantern. I want to look more, he said. I keep hearing things. He lit the lantern from the stove as he had done before. His mother said nothing. He had thought she might say, Hang it back, child, as she often did when he wanted to go along. The fence rose and Hunt would sound her after dark. Outside, he murmured to himself, That stove, I reckon. He put the lantern on the ground and tried to see under the cabin. Nothing moved in the dim light. He wished the light would shine in Sounder's eyes and he would see them in the dark, but he, it didn't backing from under the porch on his hands and knees he touched the lantern and tipped it over he grabbed it by the wire rim that held the top of the globe and it burned his hand don't ever let it fall over it'll explode his father had said to him so many times when they hunted together he sucked his burn fingers to draw out the fire Saunders' pan was on the ground and someone had stepped on it the mean man who had kicked him with his big boot the boy thought he straightened it as best he could with his hurt fingers and put it on the porch. He blew out the lantern and hung it by the possum sack. He stood on the porch and listened to the far away. The lantern he had seen going into the foothills had disappeared. There were gravestones behind the meeting house. Some were already hidden from the brambles. If the deputy sheriff had turned around in the seat of the wagon and shot his father, the visiting preacher, and somebody would bring him back, and bury him behind the meeting house, the boy thought. And if Sounder, Sounder dies, I won't drag him over to the hard earth. I'll carry him. I know I can carry him if I try hard enough. And I'll bury him across the field near the fence row under the big jack oak tree. The boy picked up Sounder's bent tin pan and carried it into the cabin. The woman passed, pushed back her chair for a brief second in surprise and half opened her mouth, but seeing the boy's face in the lamplight, she closed her mouth, and the rocker came slowly back to its standing position. Her head tilted forward again, her eyes fixed on the boy's uneaten supper, still warming on the back of the stove. 
In the corner of the room next to the dish cupboard, the boy filled Sarner's tin with cold ham boil from the possum kettle. What's that for, child? asked the mother slowly, as though she were sorry she had asked and would like to take it back. For if he comes out. You're hungry, child. Feed yourself. The boy put Sunder, Sounders tin under the porch, closed the door, pushed the night latch, sat down behind the stove, and began to eat his supper.